We won, yeah. <laughs> they suck, yeah. <laughs> we here, yeah. What's that sound? Oh, it's the Source to Stay alarm. I'm Juliette Littman. I'm Chris Ryan. First Source to Stay of the New Year. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. Oh, Jinx. Jinx. Buy me a Coke. We're here in 2018. <laughs> How does it feel? It feels great. It feels like it's been a little bit of a quiet time for our podcast. Like, I don't feel like this has been a season of of ill repute yet. Me neither. There's not a lot of... At least not on the surface. That's true. What's the biggest feud in the NBA right now? I guess it's probably Kyrie and... Kyrie and the... And and the the Cavs. Cavs? Okay. We're going to talk about them, but first I want to start with some love. A few days before the new year, the best development of 2017 came to light, and it was photographs of Laura Dern from Big Little Lies and several other films and daughter of Bruce Dern, so she's Hollywood royalty. Um, and Star Wars. She was just in The Last Jedi. I haven't seen that yet, but yeah. okay. And pivotal role. She Really? Yeah, pivotal. Okay, so it was a big 2017 for Laura Dern already. Yes. And then she was photographed making out with uh, former NBA player Baron Davis outside of the Beverly Hills Hotel. Yeah. And this was, I believe, on Thursday, December 28th. I will never forget where I was when I found out about this, and it made me inordinately happy. It's like the best thing that's happened to me in a really long time. So is that because you're a huge Dern head? No. Is it because you're a huge Baron person? No. What's so cool about it? Just I, like that love, like anyone can find love in the weirdest places. It's such a random couple. Yeah. How did they meet? Like where do, where do Laura Dern and Baron Davis meet? Yeah, I have a bunch of questions about this. I have a theory about it. Okay. She is having like a big 2017 and she's like behind the scenes and, 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 and both in front of the camera. And he is like a filmmaker and like he made a documentary with the Drew Lee. Uh-huh. And I was thinking like maybe they met like, try, like trying to like collaborate on a project. This is complete conjecture. So it's a beautifully framed photograph of them kissing. Outside of the Beverly Looks Hotel, very yeah. staged, frankly. Not in a bad way, but just like I feel like they knew that they were coming out or something okay. like that. And they Counterpoint. Like, we're outside of the hotel and now we kiss. Counterpoint. He's holding her purse. I'm not saying it's not sincere. I'm just saying it's staged. <laughs> like you thought they just knew there'd be cameras at the Beverly Hills. Yeah, why not? I mean, like if you if you don't want to get, fo- I'm not trying to negate this love at all. Okay, I think it's real. I think it's beautiful. I don't know if it's love. I think it's important. But I but I just think I'm it excited. was staged. They kissed outside of the hotel. You know what I mean? Like love, lovely, lovely composition for the TMZ photograph. And it it led me to this question, Julia. Oh wow. Okay. It doesn't necessarily have to be in a romantic interlude. But if you were to be photographed by TMZ leaving any Los Angeles building, uh-huh. what would it be? What would you want wow. to be associated with? Um, like True Food Kitchen? The Broad. Excellent. It's The Broad. Excellent. <laughs> Why? <laughs> you mean with my like with my hot basketball boyfriend or just like in general? Any In general. Still, but yeah, a hot basketball boyfriend coming out of The Broad? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Me and my hot basketball boyfriend leaving The Broad is basically like the the biggest dream I can dream right now. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> it's because Malibu it's real true. estate is well, your biggest dream. And then we would just get in the car and drive to my Malibu home. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But yeah, if I, if, if I was going to be like photographed on a date, it would definitely be a museum date for sure. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I would be worried to go on a museum date at this point in my life because I get really sleepy in museums after a <laughs> while, and I just feel like I wouldn't be that good of a date. And plus, like a lot of my uh, charm is tied up in like talking a lot, sure. and you can't really do that in a museum. That's you know? true. Beverly Hills Hotel, they had some they had some issues where like you, people were protesting because of like the ownership for oh, a while, but okay. now, now it's it's been resolved, and it's like a real kind of like old LA place. It makes sense for Baron Davis and Laura Dern; they're both from LA. It's, it's true, like, L.A. kids. Yeah, I mean, you know, he famously went to Crossroads. Like I said, she's Bruce Dern's daughter. Like, and she used to date Ben Harper. She was married to Ben Harper, for whom she, she dated could... Nicolas Cage, right? Let's just let's stop for one second. Okay. She dated. She was married to Ben Harper. They have two kids. She converted to Judaism for him. Okay. That's like one of the biggest facts <laughs> in my life. It's something that my family has always been like keenly what? aware of and discussed. Why do you care? Because she, because it's just it's she you guys the can tribe. you guys can still recruit. It's You're just, like Coach K. Still she, got it. You can still get one and done players. <laughs> <laughs> she also dated Common. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Um, and yeah, she also dated Nicolas Cage. Uh-huh. She was recently had a spread in Architectural Digest where she has a very like ar- she's a very like architectural friendly home, a lot of clean lines. This was covered on Jam Session. There's a courtyard in the middle of her home. It, it's a real kind of like you guys talked about Laura Dern's Architectural Digest thing before she started dating Baron Davis. Oh yes. Okay. Big Little Lies shot her back into relevancy. Yeah. And then, and then she won a gold, or an Emmy for being on the show. Yeah, and I think she'll probably win a Globe. Yeah, so it's Dern's moment. Oh, my God. What if he goes with her to the Golden Globes on Sunday? 
Shit. I didn't even think about that. I'm so excited. <laughs> He's probably bummed that they weren't dating earlier so he could go, he could go to the Star Wars premiere. Although well, I bet he could go to the Star Wars premiere. Glad you brought that up and I wanted to discuss this. He's recently divorced, six months out. Okay. He was married to Jordana Brewster's sister. Interesting. They have kids together. So I I'm not sure this is like really that serious. It also might be new because um he has been in LA for the last week while she's been in Hawaii. Mm-hmm. I, I immediately like started tracking. Why was she in Hawaii shooting something? Just vacation, okay. I think. Or maybe shooting something, but I think it's just like vacation time. I think it's healthy to have separate vacations. Totally. I mean also like they just they, I, I assume this is a fairly new relationship. Yeah. But who knows? Um, what did you think about his attire for their date? Uh, let me re- I'll tell you. I'll tell there. you what it was for those of you who are just listening to this podcast. He was wearing a red crew neck sweatshirt with like designer black sweatpants and then red and black Jordans. Like Jordan. She looks incredible. Uh, she's wearing a black raincoat type thing with a not fishnet, but like a kind of printed stocking. Uh-huh. Is that what that is? Mm-hmm. And then these uh, designer like, ankle boots. Yeah, and like a, a tweed dress. She's like... She's doing great. She's going to lunch like near Columbus Circle. They're Alexander McQueen boots? Yes, they are. And she's like going to lunch in Manhattan for like ca- casual lunch with friends and he's like just like super LA guy right now. Yeah. Like just wearing his sweats. Super for, for, for former athlete. Like in college, you always could spot the athletes from like very far away because they were in like their, their cool sweats. That's what Baron Davis is doing right now. But Man, he, they look deeply into each other. Yeah! Thank you, Chris. You doubted it before. <laughs> also, like, just, I don't know. I'm so excited about it. It's such a random coupling, and I, it's just, it's just made, brought me so much joy. If you could pair one of another actress in your constellation with an NBA player, what would it be? Wow. Um, hmm. Another actress? I want Not Saoirse- to break up any marriages sure. or whatever. Let's yeah. get Saoirse Ronan an NBA boyfriend. Oh, man. Yeah. But, like, a cool, heady one. Not no. like Andre Drummond. No. No. Definitely not. Like, Doug McDermott? Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, I think more of like a someone who's a little bit more hipster than that. In- Rubio? Hmm. That would be like a real like international. Hmm. I don't know. She's so great. I'm just so high on her right now. I, <laughs> I've just watched all of her work like in the last <laughs> two months. Um, God, who else should we be? Who else needs a cool celebrity girlfriend? I mean, obviously Lonzo Ball needs a better girlfriend. No offense to his current girlfriend, but like for his. his- Kuzma. Uh, Kuzma and Sorsha? No. Def, def not. You're not into Kuzma? No. I honestly think Blake and Sorsha would be a great couple, but he's he's taken. <laughs> but he's an actor as well. So <laughs> he she. is an actor. They could talk shop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know. I'm just so excited about Baron Davis and Laura Dern. I, I don't know. This is the kind of story that I was put on the earth to care about. It did. It was a Christmas gift. It really was. A Hanukkah I, gift. I literally you. had like 15 simultaneous conversations about it. I texted so many people. I think I you know. actually said in Slack. Is this my best pop culture day? Yes, because then on the same day, Prince Harry interviewed Barack Obama on and the they BBC, talked about and he asked him, "Good wife, right?" They're doing rapid fire questions, and and Prince Harry said, "Good wife or suits?" And obviously, he chose suits. Barack, I, I'm sure he likes the good wife more. Yeah. But being the politician that he is, he said uh, suits. And yeah, I mean, it was basically the best day of my life. So <laughs> I don't, I don't really know what else to say. <laughs> just incredible. <laughs> Uh, we can move on now, but that's just. I mean, of... I'm here for it. Whatever you want to talk about, I'll never move on. If they ever break up, like I'll always remember. What, what's the age uh, similarity between these two? Just um, out of curiosity. He's 38, and she is 51 or 52, I believe. Oh, older lady. Yes, she's 50. Excuse me. Baron Davis is 38. Doesn't he feel like he should be like a minimum 45? Baron, Baron Davis. I feel like Baron Davis has been in my life for the entirety of my life. I can't remember a time when he wasn't around. Like, yeah. Somehow, I saw him like out. Also, because the end of his career was marred by such like crazy back problems that I associate more with like deep middle age you know like yeah. he had that brace on remember totally yeah. and then he wanted to come back and it just and also he's on a couple of like legendary teams he had a really bad knee injury too at the end of his career right really bad yeah, yeah. really bad I and saw him on the beach once chilling out um seems I like s- a very popular guy I saw him in Beverly Hills recently and then he's been on Bill's pod he came through here he seems like a very congenial dude yeah I don't know what a great power couple like do they hang out with Reese Witherspoon I don't know. I don't know. Reese is really busy. She's making a lot of content right now. So is Laura. Okay. <laughs> I feel like you're like a, you're rude to Laura Dern. I don't know why. Okay. That's she was also on Twin Peaks. I watched more Laura Dern content than you did last year. I'm yes, a huge yes. supporter of her. You definitely did. Yeah. I, I'm a huge supporter of her as a, a new member of the Jewish community. 
Okay. That's like the biggest deal there is. Lahayim. Okay. <laughs> Lahayim. Um, this is my main event, but the rest of the rest of the the rest of the basketball world's main event comes tonight. The Celtics are playing the Cavs in Boston. Yes, but is I don't think IT is going to play, even though no, he torched not. the Blazers last night, and it just was awesome to see him back. I am a huge Isaiah Thomas supporter. We, uh, we all are. But eh, it's, it's you're just, not. Why don't you just come out and say it? It's compulsory. That's why I don't like it. It's not compulsory. He said he wouldn't play have played in the playoffs if he knew he wasn't going to be on the Celtics, that he basically and sacrificed I... his body with a, the thought being like, I will be here in, for the rest of my career. We'll figure it out down the line. I don't know. I, I just don't know that I'm okay with this sort of like relitigating of what happened. I feel, I, I, I think it, something incredibly tragic happened to him. His sister dying and then yes. he's still playing is like unbelievably tragic. I wouldn't Incredible have played if played. I had had multiple dental surgeries. I wouldn't come to work for like a month if I, know, I had the it. amount of teeth knocked out that he did. I just feel like we're conflating so many different issues. Like okay. getting traded is a fact of being in the NBA and yes. it sucks that he got traded when he was hurt. And um, really, like, just a lot of unfortunate circumstances around him. But I'm not really sure what everyone in Cleveland was cheering last night when he took the court for what the do first you mean? time. Well, like, they were cheering that, like, his, that, he, that, that he there were some people talking about how this hip problem could end his career. Who was saying that, though? There was rumors. From who? Okay. I mean, this, like, the b- foundation <laughs> of this podcast is rumors. Now, all of a sudden, everything has to be triple sourced? Well, I, I just... I think he had he, a really bad hip injury that has ruined other people's careers. In I the think past. he's really likable and he's fun to watch. And he was an amazing dynamo last year and he carried that Boston team. But I, I just think this sort of like we all have to root for Isaiah. I think that that happens for everybody. And I am sitting across the table from someone whose favorite moment of last year was literally Kobe's retirement number retirement celebration. And, and, but it's not because he deserved it because it was so over the top and absur- absurd. OK, but you really loved it. I mean, yeah, I'm not I, saying Isaiah is anywhere close. Yeah. And so the Cavs fans were trying to welcome him to the team. I agree with you that there's definitely, like, on one side, he's like, the only reason this keeps coming up is because people keep asking me about it. And then on the other side, he's doing, like, little mini docs about his, like, exit from Boston. I think he's pissed off at Danny Ainge. I think he probably would not have played during the playoffs with, like, if he was like, I'm at 60%, I could really aggravate this hip injury, but this is a special team, this is a special moment, I'm going to push forward. And he did, and he tried, and they lost. But, you know, I mean... I think he has every right to feel a little away about it, for sure. I completely agree. I think that Boston used him up and trade him. I am not a feelings denier. I encourage everyone to feel their feelings. Yes. And, and that's, you know, that's I completely support it. But I'm just saying, like, me as, like, a fan of basketball, I'm, I am I don't understand why I have to, like, be living my life for Isaiah Thomas's return. Okay, I get it. I get just, it. Like, it's I, fine. Like, <laughs> Sorry. No, I don't. I'm not personally <laughs> invested in his return or his exit. I just really like watching him play. Me too. And I think he got screwed a little bit. And it makes the Cavs more makes the Cavs more fun and, yes. a, and a better team. Yeah. And they actually like it was a nice little gear change because you know just for the whole year you've been watching like Calderon yeah. and whoever else they can muster up to play point guard. And Isaiah just has he's still really bad on defense, but he's he has just like a little bit of a spark. He's like a different pace. He's, for yeah. Them. He's he's a great player and it's like exciting it's exciting that he's back. But I'm just saying the sort of like. I can't believe it. Like, thank God he's back on the court. Oh, it's, yeah, it's just but like, that's just like, like over- every time somebody goes down, that's just Odo oh culture. Not It's like Odo, oh not AD culture. Yeah, I, I guess so. Yeah, but it's like we don't have any – it's like we have no – vocabulary anymore to talk about injuries that like you make it sound like it's saving private Ryan when these yeah. guys fall down. Yeah. It, and it's like ridiculous. Yeah. It's like it's like the the folklore of Isaiah Thomas based on one season is completely out of hand. I, like his tra- the tragedy with his sister is like so horrible. And sure. I, I don't want to like minimize that at all. I think that that's he actually his, it's almost like this old fashioned thing where he was like this this like you said folk hero. Yeah. And because of social media folk heroes are just like Incessant, and you, game. and they're just also like it's you just get so annoyed by it. Whereas like if this was just like on the back page of the Boston Herald in 1994, you wouldn't give a shit. Right. Yeah. It's just like it's just a lot. So anyway, he's not playing tonight. Okay, but this but, story churns and churns and churns. So for a while, it's been on Isaiah where it's like, did, was is Isaiah mad at Danny? Did Isaiah play want to play in the playoffs if he knew he was going to be dealt? Yada yada. And when's he going to come back? And they're playing tonight. I don't. It was said that he was not going to play tonight. I don't know now if that might be changed. This is a back-to-back for them. Yeah. Um, but this morning, Jackie Mack on ESPN.com dropped a big Kyrie feature. And you, just every time you think maybe Kyrie is, like, wrapped up, like, his his speech that he's mm-hmm. been giving this season, he just dials up some more stuff. She did. I, I guarantee. All right. I can't guarantee. But I would strongly um, – uh, I would strongly believe that he probably said some like weird like Earth is flat stuff that she just didn't print. Well, let me just say, 
I think Jackie Mack might be my favorite basketball writer. I think right, so too. Right I, I totally and, agree. She doesn't um there's not the same kind of like sentimentality. Like no. it doesn't doesn't drench her writing, which I'm so sick of. Yeah. And she gets she obviously gets really good access. And um she had more like named sources than any profile I can remember. Just, in there's also history. like a grace and a calmness to yes. like her writing that I really respect. Yeah, there's to no, right there's now. no sort of like, here's my big drop, like read it up, bitches. Right. right. She's like <laughs> I can imagine if Jackie McMullen was like, "Here's my drop, bitches." <laughs> She's she really is like a, yeah. like the the model for these kinds of stories. I can't believe the two people who host a podcast that starts with an alarm and is just about like sources <laughs> say and it's screamed about Baron Davis and Laura Dern for ten minutes. Are like it's really all about the grace with which Jackie McMullen well, handles herself. I like how she names her sources. There's, I do too. There's very few unnames in there, and that is increasingly rare in the NBA. I only had to wonder like one time, like, "Huh, I wonder who said this." So this is an interesting piece because I really encourage people to read it because it kind of begins as a Kyrie profile. Yes. And most of the times what happens when you get like a profile going is there is a tacit agreement with the subject that at least in sports media that things are just going to be somewhat told from that subject's perspective, right? Or that they it's not going to be necessarily all flattering, but that a lot of the stuff is going to be filtered through their lens. And what's interesting about this piece is that it's initially about Kyrie and it's about Kyrie's life really. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of gets into Cleveland and it kind of changes perspective a little bit. And it's more about not only like what he was frustrated by in Cleveland, but maybe what was frustrating about him in Cleveland. Yes. So yeah. there's a specific scene where they were running, uh, so they were playing in practice and Ty Lue came up to Kyrie Irving and was just like, you got to slow, you, you need to, speed up the yeah, play like so speed up shots. the tempo so we can get more shots it's just basically and Kyrie was just and like, he says specifically for RJ and JR yes and Kyrie's just basically like I can get shots no matter what tempo like I don't need to play at a fast tempo like I can get because he can create space like yeah. at a, from a standstill and Tyra Lou is like well it's for other players on the team it's about getting the ball to these guys and he goes that's LeBron's job he says that's number 23's job right he doesn't even say LeBron right um, which is fascinating. Yes. Sounds like a, a real prick. Yes. In, Wait, yeah. Or, and also somebody who was just thinking about things from their perspective of like, I know what I'm capable of. It's up to these other guys to be capable of it as well. Yeah. And also like, this is another guy's job. It's also very sort of like, um, like without emotion, like this is what I do here. This yeah. is what he does. And like, I'm going to do my thing and he does his. What and I, what was really fascinating to me about this piece though, and it's something that I don't think goes remarked upon a lot because this is a pretty unique trade in a lot of ways, like at least in terms of the way it's been talked about afterwards. Cause if you think back from other, some of the other things where people have forced themselves off teams, like whether it was PG last year with the Pacers mm -hmm. or mellow, even back from the nuggets days, like when mellow basically was like, this is where I, I just want to get out of here. And this is where I want to go. And you should trade me now. Um, this Kyrie trade is, it seems like a lot more rooted in Kyrie's conception of himself and it has like a real kind of normalcy to it where you're like, oh yeah, maybe you were just tired of being in this specific situation. And it sounds like almost going to the finals took away some of the luster of being in Cleveland. For sure. Him. It's like sort of like he got to the mountaintop. Yeah, there. it's like, what else can I really do here with LeBron? Yeah, there's a couple of anecdotes about how he's always like looking for a new challenge. Um, I forget which one of his team, former teammates said it, but it was like he he or he asked Amon Shumpert to ambush him in the layup line before yeah. game so he yeah. could like practice his. And finishes. he was like, Kyrie makes things harder on himself yeah. on purpose. Yeah, and um, there's a, also a great anecdote at the beginning about when he first meets Michael Kidd Gilchrist in high school mm -hmm. and how he just sort of like brings it to him. And Kyrie just seems like a loner who wants to like be his best and like test himself, yeah. which is not doesn't necessarily lend itself to being a great teammate. Though it does seem like he has quite a few. Like, he's still friendly with the former Cavs Yeah, players. for sure. I, I think none, none of these things are as soap opera -y as they probably come off in, yeah. in print. I think that also one thing this piece does is it had been rumored for a while that Kyrie was pissed that the Cavs thought about trading him for, to for get Paul For the first George. time to get Eric Bledsoe. Yeah, and Jim, yeah. when Dan Gilbert was still and there. And because Eric Bledsoe is a clutch client. Yeah, it was like LeBron pulling the strings. And LeBron has openly said, like, that's in, that's nuts. That's not true. Yeah. yeah. Um, that had been rumored for a while. I don't think it had been committed to print before. But yes. so it's sort of like almost like a. Yeah, I think now, Windhorse had talked about it. Like, yeah. people have talked about it, but it was. It's been mentioned, but it hasn't been like confirmed or like sources like this kind of like sourcing or whatever yeah. so now it's like part of the record that's kind of interesting it changes the timeline of how we think about the Kyrie trade a little bit and it also like one of my big takeaways for this as a Kyrie defender is like 
like Dan Gilbert just breeds chaos. Like that's kind of like underlying the, the Cleveland section. Yeah. Where she's like, you know, Jackie points out that he never extends any of his GMs and, um, she he met Gilbert met with Kyrie and his agent Jeff Wexler and then he went to Vegas for summer league and that's when all the details came out mm-hmm. and like all of the basketball world is in Vegas, Vegas. together yes. and it just sort of made it, it it actually I thought in some ways absolved Kyrie a little bit and also absolved LeBron and just made it seem like the Cavs were a mess over the summer yeah I think I mean there's there's also this underlying plot line that came up in a Sports Illustrated post off of this or this morning too which is just the idea that part of the reason why Kyrie also wanted out was just the lack of clarity on yeah. LeBron's. Now that feels like a little like counter programming to me. Like, well, it's not my fault. Like LeBron won't commit to Cleveland. Why should I, you yeah. know? And if I can get out while the getting's good and go to a contending team, like I'll do that. But it's where, where's your head at in terms of, I feel like the LeBron exit stuff has been remarkably well handled by LeBron this season. Sure. It has not become something like with Oklahoma. I think when they were losing games, it became like, should they trade Paul George at this trade yeah. deadline to get whatever they can from him? What are they going to do now that they have Melo on their books and stuff? But LeBron has been – every once in a while, somebody will just be like, he's going to L.A. We wrote about how Houston is a fit for him. People have talked about Philly. But, like, he seems like he's having a really good season with Cleveland. He's probably going to win the MVP award if he stays healthy this season. I mean, I, I kind of I, – I personally, at this point, kind of see another two-year deal for him. It's so – I would say it's so hard to imagine him leaving. I, so, I think he probably will, but, like – I don't know, like, wh- if you're playing with your best friend, Dwayne Wade, you're playing pretty well. If they figure things out with IT, like, why would you leave? It's like, LeBron, if LeBron stays healthy, he's going to be the MVP this season, especially now that Harden's going to be out for a few weeks, probably. Right. Yeah, you know, and, and I think that he's putting up his MVP number season that when Horace had said before, like, when his, when his PR is this high, he's, he's always won the MVP. So, I don't know. I, I kind of see another two-year deal, one-year, one-player one one. option. It may, it may not be good for the Cavs in terms of their long-term planning, but it's probably good for Cleveland in terms of being the epicenter of the NBA. Yeah, and, and I guess it also just depends on, like, what are the other options? Like, I don't know if the Lakers are really that appealing. I mean, everyone says well, we're going to get into that. Yeah. yeah, we'll talk about them in a minute. But like, you're playing with Dwayne Wade. If they figure things out with it, like, why would you? They have the leave? pick. Yeah, they have the pick. They have the pick. They can trade it or they can use it. Kevin Love's playing much better. It seems like Still also a soft conference. This is like the fourth year for Kevin Love and LeBron together, and it seems like they've actually really developed like a chemistry on the court yeah. in a way that. You, you forget, especially with these super teams, like sometimes it takes a couple of seasons for guys to get used to each other and their bodies totally. go through changes. They change positions. They change styles. Like it's just really interesting to watch them. Who do you think wins tonight? Uh, Boston, because Cleveland's coming off a back to back and that was right. a pretty tough game. Right. I just, na- this is the part of the season where I just like every time I, it, anything happens, I'm like, I just look at the schedule and see how many games guys sure. have played. Sure. So let's talk about the Lakers. I'm looking a little forward bit. to it. Um, can we talk about the Celtics one, one more? Second? Oh, for sure. I love talking about the Celtics. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just not ready to move on. Um, I noticed that the Celtics celebrated New Year's together mm-hmm. via Jalen Brown's Instagram. He did like a slideshow. Um, and this was alerted to me by our good friend, intern Andrew Sharp. Sharp. Um, they all went out somewhere. And like for some reason, Jalen Brown tagged it at like this place, the New Leaf, which is like a juice place in Needham, Massachusetts. Okay. And I was like trying to figure out where they are. And they, this is on Jalen Brown's Instagram. This is his most recent post, if you guys want to check it out. And it's like, it looks like they're in like a ballroom of a hotel. And I just don't know what kind of like deception he's going for. It's very confusing to me. So you think it's, it's a, maybe it's a New Leaf that's inside of a. I think hotel no I think he just was like oh this is funny new year it's like it's a turning over a new leaf so he like he like probably goes there as his juice place or something so like that so you think J- Jalen Brown's making puns in his Instagram tags he's very heady Chris don't okay you know, don't you know about that okay and then my other thought was Jason Tatum is um he's in these pictures he's, he's a teen yeah. he's underage so like if they're at a club they probably don't want to like advertise that although I don't know if NBA players worry about that yeah I, I mean I why would. take the Instagram photo in the first place if you're not trying to do advertise it gotta it. do it for the gram okay so you did it and you pretended like you were at a juice place on New Year's Eve yeah there's this picture of Jason Tatum Marcus Smart Sh- Shane Larkin and Jalen Brown and I'm just like what a quartet like do these four go out together regularly two J's Marcus and Shane huh uh-huh that's great what a squad <laughs> What a, what a crew. It's, it's, uh, where was Kyrie on New Year's? He was there too. Okay. He was wearing a great leather, uh, velvet blazer. I wasn't sure if maybe he didn't believe in New Year's because the day, like years aren't actually 365 days and that's just a construct. I think he believes in New Year's, but I don't know <laughs> if he like acknowledges the spinning of the earth. So it might mean something different to him. Right. Right. Like maybe it's just like, 
a night you stay up late. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Um, okay, now we can move on to the Lakers. Yeah, Bill, Bill O'Ram in the uh, OC register. Um, he had an article the other day about the Lakers having a team meeting, uh, sort of airing some grievances that Julius Randle was – his minutes and like his his sort of role in the team was sort of an issue and that the players talked to the coaches one of their forwards was upset about minutes what (laughs) i'm so surprised um we are seeing the lakers stress test about like whether or not you can have all this excitement about young players when there is also the major rumor that most of these young players might be used as make weights or need to get jettisoned to make cap room for multiple all nba players i really want to believe in luke walton but He's not giving me a lot to work with. It's not necessarily his fault. Yes. But there's definitely not a lot of good, like, personnel management going on with this team. Yeah, I think that Luke Walton would like to be running Warriors stuff, and it turns out that much like running the triangle with the Bulls, like, Warriors stuff looks good when Steph Curry's the point guard yeah. and Draymond Green is your point forward, but yeah. it doesn't look great when it's these guys. Yeah, it's tough. Um, I do think Brandon Ingram is good. I think Brandon Ingram's good, good too. And Kuz is is legit. Yeah. What do you, where are you at on Lonzo Ball? Uh, I I think all the rookies have gotten out of their like incredible my uh, of them under the microscope and now can just be rookies now. That's mm-hmm. my take. Mm-hmm. So Tatum is continues to be good and you, know, you get good at Dennis Smith night nights. But for the most part, like, I think all these, a lot of these rookies have like stepped into the like, oh, it's it's really hard to play basketball in the NBA for 82 games. Yeah, I I just think the Lakers are in trouble though. The Lakers are one and nine in their last ten. They suck. They do suck. Yeah, and they're like, there's just we knew this was gonna happen though. We knew that the Lakers like the first six weeks would be like really fun, and then they're just gonna be really bad and, and be a mess. So, like, they are fun to watch on a night to night basis. They have cool players. Like it's fun to watch Nance. It's fun to watch Kuzma. It's fun to watch Ingram. Lonzo makes interesting passes. KCP, you never know what's gonna happen. I just don't know what the plan is. Like I I know they say it's like get two max players and get rid of a lot of this team well it's not even it's not unlike the 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 Cavs in in that sense where it's like the plan is to win as many games as you can but like I they obviously are I don't I think it's it's interesting because Palinka I bet would build through the draft Mm -hmm. slow and and put together little pieces right whereas it's like I just don't think you can keep magic away from the the lights he's gonna want to get an all like a big time NBA talent yeah by the way the most insane thing about Kobe day Kobe mm. Knight was magic saying he was the, that Kobe was the most important Laker of all time. That was crazy. That was absolutely <laughs> insane. Just want to throw that out there. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, like show me a team that has done that. Like, 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 there's no, there's not a lot of evidence that you know going after free agents will necessarily be the better path to winning a championship. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll Ca- see. Cavs not not notwithstanding, but LeBron's an exception to every rule in the NBA. We'll see see when the Thunder are in the finals. When the Thunder in the finals, I mean, today Russ did say that. They um, asked him, yeah, they said, like, what's your pitch to Paul George to stay? And he's like, win a championship, beat that pitch. Yeah. Um, Russ is still good. Russ has still got it. The, the, the Thunder are not, are not dead yet. Um, speaking of Paul George, there was, he said today, this is from reporting by Ramona Shelburne, that the tampering charge um, was the result of him having a conversation with Brian Shaw, but the official release from the league had said it was Palinka talking to his agent. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. This is tough, man. I think the Lakers are like, the Lakers are kind of in that, that spot now where it's like anytime they make a move, I think there's going to be a lot of scrutiny on them. I don't think they're going to get like tampering charges all the time, but it'll be interesting to see. I'll be interested to see whether or not, if this Lakers team is just garbage for the rest of the season, are they just like, be. hey, let's just get rid of these guys and, and we'll trade Randall, we'll trade Clarkson, we'll trade everybody but Ball? Maybe I mean I guess they they'd want to keep Ingram, but if they if they if they like if they it's gonna be tar- tough to make a lot of space for these guys. Question: hmm. Who would you rather have, Lonzo Ball or Markel Fultz? Markel Fultz. You would? Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah. I, I did not expect you to say that. I was you like, think I was gonna say Lonzo Ball? Fultz has not like he can't play in the NBA. I'm all in on Fultz. Okay, tell explain to me the case for Fultz as as it stands today. What's the case against him? He just hasn't played yet. He. I mean, like, he's, he's hurt. Should we just review the official like <laughs> talk from the Sixers? Like their release <laughs> earlier this season, this week was completely crazy. It said that he's now available for practice and being reintegrated into, into team, team activities. Team activities. Yeah. Who has ever needed to be reintegrated after playing like five games? He had a shoulder imbalance. Okay. <laughs> Have you figured out what that is, by the way? No, I haven't. 
Me neither. I, I don't think it's real. <laughs> <laughs> Just throwing that so out the, there. So um, Fultz has been, there's been some, a very funny thing this week has been uh, the raw footage of Fultz practicing at the Sixers gym. You arrive at work each day and immediately start watching it. Yes, I start watching it. And then it's like Fultz playing against a coach and bricking 15 footers. And then at the end of the day, the Sixers put up a tweet of like, it was like watching a propaganda film. It was like seeing like you could take the raw footage of Fultz like uninspiredly practicing and then put a trap beat over it and have Fultz do like two layups against like bench guys. And it's like, look who's back. It's Fultz, <laughs> baby. Um, but I still believe. I don't know. I just I think he's going to be fine. I think he's going to be really good. Okay. Why did every draft guy say he was the number one pick? Because he had a good shot, but he's completely changed his shot. And now he looks bad. Okay, but I saw him in July and he was fine. I don't think this could go this bad this wrong, this fast. I think it's a combination of something we're not hearing about and actually a shoulder thing, and I think he's going to be okay, and I think he's going to be really good. I just want to concern Troll a little bit more. I'm concerned about Embiid. Okay, let's hear it. Um, Because bad backs are bad? Yeah, and I just think that he probably should be taking off more games than he is like, and playing less. Like when they went to... They played against the Thunder, yeah, and that was triple overtime. He was clearly laboring up the court and and had the hadn't played the previous game because of a bad back. Yes, and I just don't know if that. I'm just concerned about how that injury or that nagging ailment is being managed. And um, there's nothing scarier than Embiid falling, and it happens like ten times a game. So, <laughs> well, that was his whole thing that he said he likes to fall because like his limbs go loose and is less like it's not as much impact. Like releases the tension. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about that, but that sounds like some weird Sixers medical jargon. Ugh, I don't know, Juliet. I don't I know just, what I want. I like, just they, I can tell that they want to get into the playoffs. I think that I they know, really they want do. to get into the playoffs, and it's they're seventeen and nineteen. They're in tenth, and it's just so funny. It's like for the Sixers, people are like. Ooh, are they playing and be too much? Like, is he okay? Is like Fultz okay? But then, like, the Knicks are one game better, and everybody's just like, what an inspirational like story about Kristaps and the Bad News Bears. So it's just like one or two games changes the way people think about you. They had a really nice start to the season. I think the difference with the Knicks though is that they are expected to be like a lot worse than they are. And yes, um, I think also there's like a I don't know anything about this, but it just seems to me that like Brett Brown is not the guy that Brian Colangelo hired. Yeah. If this team is is like super bad this year I don't know if Brett Brown comes back the following year and he I think that when I see him playing guys and I'm like why are you know I, when I, I I sometimes wonder about some of his rotations about whether or not he's in a little bit of a win now mode uh-huh well I think I think the process trusters also want it also Ben Simmons is so exciting but he's so limited he's a rookie yes but like you just want him to be better than he is and he's quite good he's yeah, gonna you just want to be able to shoot be a shot yeah yeah yeah. Outside of two feet. Yeah. yeah. Good luck, Ben. Okay. Um, <laughs> shout out to the Sixers. I hope they I hope they can figure it out. I will say one thing positive about Joel Embiid. No idea what he did for New Year's. He's not like being caught on TMZ. He's not like DMing randoms. I think that's very positive. I'm ser- I'm not joking. I'm serious. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> I think I I'm I'm pretty I, I'm okay with Embiid having like a tight back. It's like that's normal. He plays really hard. He play he takes a lot of physical contact. It's probably tough being like a, a seven footer who flies on planes and li- sleeps in different hotel beds all the time. Mm-hmm. But I agree with you. I think he could take a few more games off. I just want as much Embiid for as over as long a period. The thing of time is, is that when they don't have Embiid, they suck. They're bad. I know, and that's why we gotta protect Embiid. Bring back Fultz. Come on, Markel. Save the season. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for listening. I will be. I'm very available if anyone needs Laura Dern or Baron Davis updates. Let us know where you'd like your TMZ photo staged, listeners. Good luck beating the Broad. I mean, I can't think of anything better than me and my. Doesn't have to be Los Angeles. You know, it could be wherever your hometown is. Okay. Cool. Um, Thanks for listening, and we'll be back in two weeks.